Hi, my name is Guy Matzkin. I am currently the head coach in the Israeli archery program. Mm -hmm. I have been a competitive uh, international recurve archer myself, and I have studied uh, in my postgraduate studies in Edinburgh, and I uh, studied performance psychology, and I now work as well as a sports psychologist. We're gonna talk today uh, about a subject which personally I really, really like. I'm gonna put it now. Which is uh, uh, psychological characteristics of developing excellence, um, basically known as PCDEs, and that's how I'm gonna refer for it, to it until the end of this lecture. Uh, again, if someone has questions about this presentation, feel free to contact me on my email. Uh, it's now on the screen. Uh, feel free to attack me if I say anything that really offends you uh, at the end of this lecture. Now, what we're going to talk about today, uh, I'm going to start very briefly on what is talent and what are the differences between talent identification and talent development. Uh, then I'm going to proceed to talk about those uh, PCDEs. Uh, we will then continue, and after talking about PCDs, we're going to talk a little bit about how to identify those relevant behaviors and then how to improve uh, the behaviors to what you actually want. And I will finish up with a recent study that's uh, quite interesting. Now, uh, when I usually do this uh, presentation, it's usually in the Israeli uh, instructor, coach, coach seminar, or it's kind of like our World Archery 1.5 uh, coaches course. And it's, it's a little bit of a free uh, discussion at this point. And I stand up and ask, okay, let's, let's stop everything. What is talent in archery? And then people throw in some, some stuff about how quickly a person can learn how to do technique, um, maybe if he's obedient or if he's strong, um, it, it kind of varies, especially when you go to other sports apart from archery, you will start hearing about dribbling and um, uh, in virtuosity in, in football or basketball. Uh, and talent is a very loaded term when you, when you talk in sports sciences, there's a, a very heated discussion on is there such a thing as talent what is talent uh, it's 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 very very um, it's a very broad subject and when you go into into sports science there's a very heated uh, debate on whether we should focus our um, efforts and our um, resources in talent identification, or should we put all our eggs in the basket of talent development? Now, I'm very biased. I, 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 I'm putting it out there. I'm very biased towards talent development. Uh, it's, it's, it's where I studied in Edinburgh. It's a very talent uh, development uh, heavy faculty. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the issues with talent identification. It's, it's very much. Uh, what you expected, it's when people do scouting, it's uh, when you invest a lot of money in, 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 in analysis and statistics and, and whatnot, you try and pick up the best players, the best archers, and this approach is, is loaded with issues. For example, uh, I should probably put a few studies here because there is a very big volume on how bad talent identification is actually when you try to put a percentage um, very bad like just take my word for it um, all programs all sports all ages very low prediction um, uh, ability as a concept as a philosophy talent identification is a very very flawed concept because if you believe that either a person has talent or he doesn't have a talent that that very much limits your ability as a coach because if the kid doesn't have talent then you won't uh, you won't work with him or you will not put in as much effort as you would have otherwise uh, it's a very ethically flawed 
concept, at least in my eyes, and I have known too many coaches and that will not work with too many archers because they would not consider them as talented. It's it's very it's a big issue in my in my sense. Uh, it is also very open to biases. Uh, there is a very big bias, for example, in in age. So you'll have the same if you are a football coach, you'll have the same cohort, so all the kids born in the same year. And there is a very big bias towards kids born in the first six months of the year, so January till June, and not as much emphasis put for the kids born in July till December because they are considered less talented. And sometimes you just don't take into account that they are just smaller. They are biologically younger than they are their older counterparts, so that causes a bias as well. Um, also, when pe people tend to, when they only obsess about identification of talent, they, as, as they will come and say either they have talent or they don't have talent, then they will just not, not necessarily put as much thought as to, okay, I have a talent, what do I do with it now? Uh, and that's a flawed concept as well, so be wary of that. And finally, it's not as relevant in, in, in archery, but the inability to predict future trends. So if you work with a, let's say, a rugby player now, today, and you assume they need to have a specific role and a specific physical uh, abilities or capabilities, and then you will consider, okay, either he's talented or he's not, and then rugby will change over the next, let's say, 15 years by the time you get the kid and by the time you are done with him, and rugby might change. Rugby might become a faster sport that requires more thinking and less smashing. I don't know, it's just an example. Again, no, I would not say it's probably a big of an issue in archery as well, but this is something to take notice of. On the other hand, you have talent development. Talent development looks at it, it might be uh, semantics, but we do not look at a person as either talented or not. We look at, at, at the person that he has potential. Whatever the potential is, doesn't matter. And then you'll have um, all these things happening. You'll have the intrapersonal catalysts of the archer himself. For example, I'll put a few examples there. So motivation, perseverance, uh, those PCDs. And then you'll have stuff happening on, in the background. So the environmental catalyst, so if he has access to good coaching, if his parents or her parents are a supportive parents, uh, and do they have access to proper archery programs in their countries? There are some countries in which you might have a kid with loads of potential, uh, but the best coach there will be a level one world archery uh, course, and then you will never reach the full potential that their career has. And then when you look at talent development, at the end of it, you look at the talent as the output rather than the input. So if you do everything right, you will help the archer get as much of his potential as possible. And we really hope that by the end of the talent pathway, you will be as talented as you possibly can by systematically developing skills and physical abilities needed for that archer to succeed on the international archery stage. And why should we actually do that? That's a, it's, it's a very big question. It's like, why, why, guy, are you talking about these kinds of things? And I would say that when you uh, interview a world-class archer, when you interview a world-class coach, you will hear, um, all of them talking about how archery is a mental game, how 90% of archery is a mental game and technique or whatever is the other 10%. I don't know that if anyone has ever done a study on it, but I feel like it, it's, it's a very close ap approximation of what archery is. And then you ask the coaches, especially the grassroots, uh, the intermediate level archers, even top level, World archer, world class coaches, and you'll ask them, okay, so what do you do in practice? And they will say, uh, technique, 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 maybe some physical strengthening and conditioning, uh, a lot of tune up, uh, whatever. And and 
either zero or very, very little emphasis on what the mental skills you, that you will need for an archer in, in the same sense that you develop the mental skills over, let's say, a five, 10 year uh, development pathway, the same as you would do with this, the other stuff. You you improve on their uh, equipment over time, you would improve their uh, physical capabilities over time, their technique will improve tremendously over the years, and then you don't put as much emphasis on uh, the mental skills that you need to develop and that so so that so the lecture today is basically meant for you coaches out there to stop uh kind of look into what you believe in and what you want your archers to be at the end and then kind of plan what you want to do with them over a long time only this this uh, lecture today is only about the mental side of archery there are many many more things to do with archery but today is just about the mental game so, 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 how do what do we actually do? So, there, there have been quite a, a big, not a big. Let's say there has been a nice volume of study and literature going into those psychological characteristics that are re required to develop excellence in sports. Uh, these kinds of studies, we'll talk about a, a different one at the end. That's a little bit different, but most of them would be to interview world-class athletes musicians, performers at the end of their career, and then to stop them and say, okay, uh, what do you think uh, was necessary when you were growing up? And then to triangulate it with parents and coaches and whatever, and then you end up with, uh, with a certain list. That, that, that list looks both at trait characteristics of the athlete, and state deployed skills. So skills you need to apply at certain times and, and let's call it more personal, uh, personality kind of uh, characteristics. And then you end up with this very, very uh, nice list of characteristics. I'm gonna go over it, don't worry. That's just one example. So for example, in, in their book, which is phenomenal and every coach and practitioner in the world, in my opinion, should read it, it's called, uh, Talent uh, Development, a Practitioner's Guide by Collins and McNamara. Both are very known figures in that realm. So for example, from their book, they will talk about commitment, focus and distraction control, realistic performance evaluation, self-awareness, coping with pressure, planning and self-organization, goal setting, quality practice, imagery, and actively seeking social support. Now, this is just one example. In, in every study like this, uh, some characteristics shows up, some don't, some of them are more prevalent. So if we look at two other examples from various other studies, you'll see that, for example, commitment, uh, every single study that I have seen commitment has been identified as one of those characteristics, imagery as well. Uh, but then you'll have stuff like, uh, let's say, social skills that would appear in one and not in the rest, self-belief. Uh, so your takeaway message from this can be, if there are stuff, if there is skills or characteristics that you as coaches believe that are imperative for the world-class archer to have, you can add it, even if it's not, it, let's go in, in literature, it, it's fine. I, I've seen for ex one example in a football academy that the coach grit was very, very important to that coach to develop grit with his footballers. So we added it and then he worked on it and it's, it hasn't appeared in any study that I know of. And that's fine, that's absolutely fine. You coaches do whatever you want as long as you do it in a methodical and, and logic sense. So. After we identified those characteristics, uh, commitment is such a big word, what do we actually, as coaches, do to improve that with the archers? So first of all, we need to take into consideration that there are differences between our archers of personality, age, gender is really important, and especially the different level of expertise in archery between all archers. It's very, very, uh, let's call it very convenient to just copy paste some sort of, let's call it uh, a prescription of 
improving commitment big on the wall of the archery club and then the kid was 11 years old and the girl uh, uh, the state champion who's 17 year old and shooting compound and they will look at it and do the same you cannot expect the same uh, application from both of them and you should not do it so what do we do we break down each one of those pcbs so commitment whatever and you break them into objectively observable behaviors so let's leave the realm of theoretical concepts alone i'm going to take commitment and i'm going to break it to behaviors that i want and can promote we'll do it in a second so don't, don't worry about it then after we have those behaviors we will test we will measure we observe and we will reinforce those desirable behaviors and for your practicality, just consider these actions as visual, so which are possible to observe or measure. So if we talk about, for example, about the uh, PCB of uh, focus and distraction control, I cannot write that an observable uh, action will be, I want my archer to be uh, focused. How do you measure it? How do you observe it? Yes, it's, it's all, it's possible to uh, to notice it try and find something that's very specific and very easy to see furthermore it needs to be behavioral a uh, behavioral i.e that it will be open to discouragement or for reinforcement so for example uh, a commitment showing up early to practice is something that i'm very very fond of you'll see it in a second but if the archer comes from a very dysfunctional home, he has no way of getting to the field, uh, relying on his drunk parents to get him there. If I then come and tear him a new one for every time he's late, that will really not be beneficial. So, uh, so consider all these things, and then uh, it's a high, it's very recommended that those uh, behaviors will be positive. So not the lack of. So if I'm saying I want the person to be committed and the behavior will be, I don't want him to be a clown in practices. That will not be a right way to put it. I want him to be uh, to be a very uh, with a high work ethic while at practice and focus only on practice. That would be a better way to put it. Now I'm going to put a few archery examples, so it will kind of like frame your, your thoughts for everything that was very theoretical up till now. Again, these are only things that I wrote as a coach, as an archer, that I think for these specific uh, PCDs should be relevant for you as coaches. And go wild. Think of commitment and think what you at home think committed, commitment in archery should look like. Break it into um, uh, behaviors and implement them in your practices. I'm just giving you examples now to maybe frame your mind a little bit. So, for example, in commitment, for me as a coach, I would expect the archer to show up early for practice. If practice starts at 8, he or she should be there at half past 7. And then get ready, and at 8.00, we will start practice. We will not enter the gates, we will start practice at 8, uh, 8.00. Now, another one would be work hard in practice. So you definitely all of you know those who come to practice, shoot five ends, then they go to cafeteria, they drink a coffee, they chat up a little bit. I don't like it, so I want to see them work hard in practice. For focus and distraction control, let's give two other examples. So the ability to execute a shot in suboptimal situations. So for example, when it's raining, when uh, shots are not going as well as you want, when there is a lot of uh, noise in the background, you still want the archer to be able to do that. So that would be a skill I would work on, a behavior I want to work on. Staying up with shot cycle, even when people are talking nearby, was just a very fancy way of saying the archer needs to be on the line, focused on the line and on the shooting. And then when he goes off the line, can do whatever he wants. Sometimes you see a person in full draw, shoots a shot, and then starts talking with the person who was talking behind them about yesterday's game. I don't like it. I don't think it's beneficial for archery. Another one would be realistic performance evaluation. So uh, I like when the archer himself can tell me why the arrow didn't land in the center. 
I don't like it when they turn to me and be like, I don't know why is that kid there. I believe in uh, in making independent uh, and very strong archers. So I want them to be able to analyze their shot. And on the same way, I also want them to be able to analyze a technically bad shot, which lands in the extra. So if it hits the center, sometimes you'll, and not always, but sometimes I'll go and say, okay, I know that it hit really, really well, but it was a very poor shot, and the chance for it to land in the, in the X again is very, very slim. There's a higher chance that it will miss the target next time, and they'll say, I don't care, it hit in the middle. That is something that I cannot live in with as a coach, and I recommend you will not be able to as well. Uh, goal setting, so if the archer knows how to properly put a short, mid, long-term goal, that's fantastic. I, I uh, very much want them to be able to do it themselves. I uh, can quantify his score goal in a realistic fashion. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, archers uh, in Israel don't shoot the fit arounds anymore. Uh, I apologize, not fit around. Tom Dillon is probably <laughs> yelling at the screen somewhere right now. Uh, a World Archery 1440 round. Uh, and when one of our kids uh, went and showing the competition, I asked him before, okay, how much do you expect or want to shoot today in that competition? And he said 1350. Now, knowing this archer, I knew that there was a bigger chance of marrying uh, Balefaeli than him shooting 1350. And then I stopped him and asked him, okay, so what's your personal best at 70, 60, 50, and 30? And he said something along the line of... Uh, 315, 320, 310, and 335, which amounts somewhere to the realm of, uh, let's say, 1290, 1295, something like that. And then I was like, okay, if these are your personal best in training, how do you expect to shoot 50 points more in competition when you're not practicing at all? And he's like, oh, okay, well, fair enough. But these are things that you need to work with your archers, otherwise, they meet with competitions, they meet reality, it breaks them. This is something you need to prevent as coaches. Another example is imagery, use imagery to work up a new skill or use imagery to prepare for competitions, coping with pressure, maintaining a poker face following a bad shot or that the archer is able to shoot good shots under time pressure. So these will be behaviors that I, as a coach, would want to see with the archers. And now, how can I actually work on these behaviors? How can I implement and improve them? So the first will be to do what we just did and what each one of you should do at home one, once finishing with this presentation. You need to identify those uh, desired behaviors and, and, and bring them apart like we just did. And then you will have two separate things that you as coaches need to do. You'll have the coach behaviors, and you will have the coach systems to improve on those mental skills for the archer over time. You must give a very clear and precise feedback on these behaviors to the archers uh, as much as immediately as possible when these behaviors happen. And you will also need to clarify the desired behavior to the archers, and then the ramifications of what happens if they do it or they don't do it. We'll, we'll, we'll get more into it in a second, don't, don't worry about it. And finally, you need to really maybe even put it in writing. You cannot work on all the PCDs at the same time. This is a very clear path of destruction for the archer. You'll need to do it over time. You'll need to plan and think, okay, this archer is currently lacking in, let's say, coping with pressure. Um, first, I'm going to work on this for the next whatever amount of time needs needed, and then I'll jump to the next to the next uh, PCD, and to do it in a very very structured way. Don't see all these factors now and and, and drop everything on your archers tomorrow. And when you look at it, we look at this as a tr it's kind of let's call it a triangle. Why not? You'll have the coach systems on one side, you'll have the coach behaviors on the other side. And if they work in the same direction, we will get the behavior that we want. So for example, if we, if we talk about commitment and me wanting the archers to show up on time, so my behaviors as a coach would be to lead by example, to start on time. If 
if I tell the archers, okay, we're gonna start at eight, at eight, uh, at eight o'clock, and then everyone's there, everyone's ready, and then we start at eight fifteen. It's not a very good example, and this will cause mixed uh, messages to the archers. Uh, for example, the other would be um, to give proper feedback. So usually, coach behaviors is very very easy. It's it works on the coach's um, feedback and by leading by example. That will be the two ways mostly to deal with it. So the feedback will be archers that show up on time, get acknowledged, get praised. Archers coming up late will not be praised. They will get punished if you want. Archers on the Israeli national team, when they are late, they do push-ups. They do five push-ups for every minute that they are late. Coach systems will be to actually have, for example, structured practice. What does that mean? Some clubs work in a sense that a club is open from three o'clock till nine o'clock at night, drop in whenever you want and, and do, do whatever you want. That would not emphasize the need to showing up on time for the archers. So if you tell them, okay, we have a session, we, have, we start at three, club is open at half past two, you come in, you set up your bow, you do a warm up, and then at three we start, we start with a warm up shooting, you have two rounds of scoring, you'll have drills at the end, you'll have SPT. This is what we do. When the arch archers have structure, they are, they are more likely to be committed to practice. Uh, another example would be pre-session activities for archers arriving early. Uh, same kind of thing, if I tell the archers we start at three o'clock and, and I show up with them at half past two and the club gates will be locked until three o'clock, then again, mixed messages, they will not improve on their behavior. So if our coach systems and our coach behaviors go along hand in hand, we will have an archer that arrives early and is ready to work. Again, specifically for archery, I'm giving a very brief example. So coach behaviors, again, proper, clear, and immediate feedback, again, when possible. Sometimes you will not want to uh, let's call it confront the archer while at competition. It's not beneficial, so you wait. Otherwise, try and do it as immediate as possible. And again, lead by example. The, the more tricky or the smarter thing would be the coach systems. What you put, what you implement to your training regimen to improve those PCBEs. So for example, if I want to work on coping with pressure, there will be allocated time for pressure drills, for competitions. So if I, if I for example, if I want to uh, work I'll give you an example fairly recent. Uh, in, in the training course that we just had, in the, in the coaching course, uh, one of the kids from the national squad showed up something to do with his technique. He is very resilient. We worked on him very well. He dealt with 20 observant, uh, critical eyes looking at him like a champ. Then another archer from a club up north uh, doing compound, is not a competitive archer. The focus of 20 people looking at him and judging him for what he's doing made the guy shiver to his core. He was physically shaking to a point I've never seen an archer before. His legs were shaking. Everything was shaking. I, he was actually shooting very well, but you can see that he was not used to deal with this kind of pressure. This is easily something you can all implement in your coaching atmosphere and environment at home. Next. Focus control drills, one of my first things that he showed me or told me when I started as, a, as an archer was an example. I think it was a Chinese coach. Uh, uh, might have been. Uh, a, a girl was shooting a recurve and the coach came here to her face doing this and trying to distract her. This is easily stuff that you can do in practice. Surprise your archers. Um, get into their, under their skin. Try and interrupt them while they're shooting. This is very easy to do. If you want to work on imagery, allocate time for imagery. Uh, for it will be a very bad example if you ask an archer to work on imagery. He'll be in practice, he'll sit down for 10 minutes, get uh, through his short side process in his head, and you will come and yell at him for no shooting. That, 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 that will be very, very bad. Um, another thing you can easily do, goal setting. If you want to work on goal setting, a monthly the meeting to discuss uh, these month's goals. Did we meet them? Did we not meet them? Very easy, very, very effective. I highly recommend that. 
realistic performance evaluations or performance journal for uh, for every archer is a must in my opinion. A competition report, this is something I do with every archer uh, the minute he uh, steps off the competition uh, line. I will ask him, give me three good things that happened today and three things you need to work on for the next competition. They can think about it, they need to analyze and they need to give me an answer. This is something, again, I really recommend. And now the tricky part, and this is where you as coaches, as smart coaches, uh, come into play. Quality practice on PCDs do not have to be explicit. I hope I got the right one and not the other way around. Uh, do not have to be explicit. They do not need to know that they are working on PCDs at the moment. You can work on their character. You can work on their mental skills. Uh, it, can, it can be with their knowledge, their with, Again, if you want to work on it with them knowing that it is what it is, uh, to, for them to try and actively work on some behavior that needs to be worked on, that's fine, that's absolutely fine. If you are able to do it in a way that they don't necessarily know that you're working with them on their mental skills, that's very much, uh, that's a very good thing. If you can do it, well done. Now, this is, let's call it intro to PCDEs. Uh, I hope that this alone will cause you all guys to sit at home, plan your practice to as you plan, what you're going to work with them on their technique, on their equipment, when they buy equipment, also work with them on their mental skills. As a sports psychologist, I love it when coaches mess up tremendously and then I get loads of money uh, for, for working with them and fixing them. But try and think about it a little bit as with physiotherapy, you want to avoid your archer meeting a physiotherapist, so you work a lot on uh, uh, prevention of injury, on mobility, stuff like that. If you work on PCDEs, the chances of archers needing sports psychologists diminish. I'm currently hurting my own uh, bread and butter, but that's fine. That's what you coaches need to work on the archer's mental skills as well as everything else. And we, unfortunately, we don't do it enough. I am sure that if there is some postgraduate student listening out there and he doesn't know, he or she doesn't, don't know what they want to do for their dissertation, that would be a very cool study. How much we think mental, the mental game is important in archery and how little we work on it in real life. Now, I'm going to talk briefly on a recent study. It's from last year. On uh, which, uh, It's a very, very long title for basically saying this is the newest questionnaire uh, for measuring PCDEs. Uh, the reason why I want to talk with you is because they've done something different here that might open your eyes to the benefits of possibly working on PCDEs. So when I talked to you before and I told you PCD studies, usually what they do, they take a person at the end of their career, they, uh, they, they interview them and see what was beneficial throughout their career, and this is how we get into PCDs. What this study did, basically, is that they had a few experts in, in sports sciences, in coaching, in different areas, uh, to write questions, to write items that they thought was re relevant for, for the, um, the development of excellence, and they ended up, and they triangulated with, with each other, and they ended up with a list of 183 questions. Now they, they, they kind of, um, they did uh, two uh, pilot studies to get rid with uh, many irrelevant or not really important questions. Uh, they ended with questions that rank on a Likert scale between one, which is really not relevant to me, and six, which is very much uh, describing me, both positive and negative questions. And at the end, they ended up with 88 questions, which uh, after a very, very, very long statistical analysis, which even though I consider myself good with statistics, that was really beyond me, the whole factorial analysis doesn't really matter. They ended up with seven factors uh, under which all these 88, 88 items kind of went to. And that explained 40% of the various uh, variants in, the, in, the, in that field. 
and uh, those seven uh, factors, basically PCDs. We, we will see the PCDs in this study in a minute. And then they went with the third study. The third study was the really interesting one. They had a very, very large group for, for a sports science um, study. 342 is a very big number. So they had 342 athletes, and they had their coaches, and they asked them, listen, without the athletes knowing, on a scale from one, which is uh, from one to five, one, they have a very low chance of succeeding in their field in the future, and five, high chance of these young athletes to succeed in their sports in the future. And they asked the coaches to, uh, to score each one of them, and they made two groups. Uh, the group which had predicted uh, as no chance of succeeding, and uh, the other group as high level of succeeding, they dropped all those who were ranked as neutral, as number threes. And then they gave those two groups uh, to fill this questionnaire. And the interesting thing was that there was a very statistically significant effect that would show the, the high, let's call them, a success team were ranked higher on their PCD scores than the group that were uh, predicted as not being able to succeed. A higher score on the items that were positive and obviously a lower score on the items that were negative. And the interesting part was if you just looked at the PCDE uh, scores, you were able to predict, this is a whopping amount, you could predict the athletes who were not uh, predicted to be successful on a rate of 85.8%. This is amazing. And the, the, so you could pr also predict people of being in the successful group in a rate of 44.3%. Not as impressive, and this is something you need to take into account. Why? Because if you look at the limitations of this study, first of all, uh, again, most study in sports, uh, sports science is very Western culture orientated. So uh, this study was done exclusively on British junior men who were playing team sports. So take that into consideration if you want to go straight away and, uh, and, and rank your whole team on their PCDE scores. And most importantly, this is a measurement tool. This tool is not meant as a selection criteria. If I hear that a national team uses PCD, the PCD Q2 as a selection tool for their team, i.e. they don't select archers who are ranked low on their personality scores, the A, this is very, very unethical, and B, this is very foolish, because as you could see, uh, it, it only predicted a 44% chance the, the archers being successful or athletes being successful. So don't try and do it here. What it does give you, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice measurement tool. You can at the moment give it to an archer and then see, okay, from the questionnaire, he's very good at A, B, C, and he's very poor on D. So I, when I look at his... Uh, periodization for the next year. I know that apart from working on X, Y, Z on his technique, on his physical score, he needs to buy here his equipment, he needs to work on his, uh, on his tuning here. I also need to work on his coping skills over the next year and I want to do it with A, B and C. So this tool is very, very good to try and, and find whatever you need to work on. And most importantly, don't look at the PCD as something that is inherent to the archer is and is unchangeable. It is changeable and this is your job as coaches to also work on their mental skills more than we probably do at the moment. Uh, so from this study, again, you can see every study different factors. Some of them are, uh, are more prevalent than the others. So you'll have two negative ones that we want the archer to be very low on the score. So clinical indicators and adverse response to failure. We'll see that in a second, don't worry about it. We'll have positive things like imagery and active preparation, self-directed control and management, active coping, stuff like that. And you'll have a neutral one. Uh, for example, perfectionist tendencies. Why is it neutral? Because uh, perfectionism can be 
very, very good, and it can be very, very bad. It depends on how it is implemented on the, and the atmosphere of uh, the practice. So I, I'm not going to go through all of them. Obviously, I don't want to bore you out of your senses, but these are a few examples. So factor one would be adverse response to, I cannot say it because adverse response to failure, sorry. So an example would be, I often lie awake at night thinking things over and over. So basically rumination. Obviously, we don't want our archer to, to not do that. So we want the scores to be low on uh, stuff. Let's say, for example, safe directed control and management. My life is well organized. I am good at resisting temptation. I am lazy. So that's with an asterisk because you want to flip the score. If someone is very lazy you, and he says, OK, I'm lazy on the scale of six then you will flip it because you want because you want the score to be a negative score. Uh, what else? Seeking and using of social support. Uh, I know who to ask to get things done. Uh, if I don't know any, if I don't know something, I will find out someone who can. Active coping. I work through setbacks. This is something I personally really, really like. I can deal with whatever comes my way. Resilient archers are the best archers. They can uh, the, the rocky road of, of performance is a very, very rocky road indeed. I'm sure all of you will relate to me with that. Uh, you can also talk, when you talk about PCDs, you will also talk about the, the development pathway itself. Uh, there is a very nice uh, study about the rocky road to success. Right? I think it was written by Collins as well. Uh, what he looks in is actually very fascinating because what he will say is that uh, top level athletes will be able to cope with obstacles coming their way during their career. Less good athletes, I, I'll put it very, very badly this way, will not. They will, uh, they will uh, retire, they will not cope with it, and they will, I don't know, move to something else. I'm sure you can all think of at least one archer who has done that in your life. Uh, so what he would recommend is to implement uh, specifically designed, uh, I don't remember how he, he put it, he put it as, um, God, the word escapes me, trauma. He would say low level, low intensity designed traumas in their, uh, in their path. You will help the archer overcome that by developing PCDEs. And then you can move on to bigger and more and, and more exciting things. So for example, um, that would be the way you work on PCDs. You design, you, you look into the PCD, look at the, the behavior you want to do and or, or improve on. Then you structure how you're going to attack it. Then you measure, for example, if you're looking at coping with, uh, with focus or, or with the, sorry, coping with pressure, then you would design, let's say, a high intensity uh, test of some sort. For example, again, uh, 40 people looking at you and scoring you on your technique, uh, combined with their scores on their target with a very big prize or a big punishment if they fail in this uh, task. And then you, you see, OK, it worked. It didn't work. It needs tweaking. So I, I don't remember how they put it. They, put, they say, uh, um, write what you want, test it, tweak it, repeat. That would be the model to use it. So use this questionnaire to identify what needs to be done. Look at the behaviors you want to promote. Design your coaching environment to work on these mental skills as well. Test it under pressure, then go back to the drawing board and see if it needs to be worked on again as well. So. To surmise, uh, it's a bit shorter than, again, my last presentation. And this is a much longer uh, presentation uh, when at real time people kind of discuss and bring in their own ideas. It's always fascinating to hear other coaches' ideas on different PCDs or how to attack those PCDs. So we talked a little bit today about what is talent, uh, what is talent identification versus talent development. Then we talked about these characteristics that when you want to work on the mental skills of the archer, uh, what are those PCDEs, how to identify the behaviors you want uh, to associate with each one of those P 
PCDs, uh, then how, how with that knowledge, how you're going to improve those desires, desired behaviors using the coach systems and coaches' behaviors. And finally, we looked at the recent study of the PCDQ2 that you can use, you can use that questionnaire can be with elite level archers, can be intermediate archers as well. I would not suggest using it with novices or people that say in their first year or two of archery that would be redundant. Uh, use that to kind of structure your training plan, the periodization, how you're gonna work with your archers, that plan. So, so that was the point of today's lecture was to kind of highlight and give, put a spotlight on the fact that we don't work on the mental skills as much as we should in archery, uh, how to attack this and how to work with it. And I hope that kind of helped all you guys. Um, uh, yeah, these are the references to everything that I talked about today. McNamara and Collins are the leading uh, researchers on this field. If you guys have any questions, anything, uh, my email, again, I'll jump to it quickly, is here. Feel free, annoy me as much as you want. I really hope that this helped you guys. And thank you, World Archery, for hosting these seminars. They've been uh, tremendously interesting so far.